Alex Matrosov, The Advanced Trust Evolution, Research Arm Race. This talk will uh, cover the brains of the evolution of advanced trust to evolution of lack of evolution of the tools for forensics and reverse engineering. Okay, now it's better. Good morning, everyone. I'm super, to, super happy to be here and present my research for the first presentation on ECHO 15, it's anniversary of the conference, and last time I've been on this stage in ECHO 10, so super happy to be uh, again on the stage with ECHO Party. So, good morning, ECHO Party, and today we will be talking about the advanced threat evolution, especially on researchers' arm race, how they basically companies develop the mitigations and how mitigation reflect on modern threats. I'm Alex Matrosov, I'm Chief Offensive Security Researcher with NVIDIA, and I'm doing security research almost 20 years from 1997 on different things, including malware research, then I switched to hardware and firmware researcher, and uh, let's focus more on what I prepared today. So, how a good idea about this research? Uh, basically, I was working on uh, reverse engineering uh, rootkits and bootkits in the past with my previous employee, ESET. And um, I did a lot of research on the rootkits and bootkits, and now I'm actually working mostly on the firmware side, and I can see how the trends actually going deeper and deeper, closer and closer to the firmware and hardware stuff. And it's not accidentally, actually, it's the reason, because you can see this iceberg, and uh, actually, if we look on the industry, we can have kind of like the security industry visibility point. But a lot of persistent technique based on the hardware and firmware, it's out of scope of the modern security solutions. And it's kind of like a point where the industry doesn't see anything, unfortunately. And. Um, if we talk about evolution of persistent techniques, we can always think about the mitigations. Mitigations, which is vendors of the operating system uh, develop, and also what is actually modern endpoints prepare for detect complex threats. And mitigations against malware persistent techniques are raising the bar of complexity. And, but this bar is always only for the most common threats. It's not like they develop something to detect everything or solve the problem. They usually find some example of the threat which is needed some development for the solution. Think about the rootkits. Rootkits actually drive endpoint solution to develop host intrusion prevention systems. And the bootkits was totally bypass everything, and then endpoint solution vendors develop something to detect them. And you can see on this picture where we look on the mitigations and how the persistence complexity shift from the operating system downside the stack. Rootkits actually been gone by code signing policies for the drivers in kernel, patch guards and other things. And then the bootkits mostly been um, gone from visibility because of secure boot, right? Microsoft starts secure boot uh, switch on by default from Windows 8. And it's changed a lot, the attack surface. And now we can see how the BIOS implants actually uh, coming up on the radars, but it's not new threats, right? Because it was here for years, but nobody see it. If we think about stack of the solutions which we have, and what is covered by antivirus and endpoint solutions, we can see, okay, they pretty much control the operating system level, but what about the firmware and hardware? Because actually it's hard to develop something on that level, 
uh, firmware doesn't provide any interface to the vendors to basically develop any solutions and visibility there, hardware either, because it's very hard to go and uh, see what is going on on the hardware and silicon level. Um, I wrote this book, but it's not about that. So we actually especially uh, have the art on the cover, cracking, and some person try to uh, actually escape from the Kraken. And it was because of, we was thinking, okay, it's a malware researcher, and it is some very complex thread, and he's scary because he don't know what to do. <laughs> and uh, golden age of fruit keys actually happens in 2016 to 2012. After that, actually, it's not a lot of threads being feasible uh, based on the complexity of the rootkits before. And mostly, it's been driven by cyber, uh, cyber crime actors, which is what focused on the persistence for the spam and DDoS bots, because both of these uh, malicious activities need to be uh, persistent for a long time inside the machine. And in 2011 to 2015, it was a golden age of the boot kits because uh, the same things, need, cybercrime needed persistence for spam bots and DDoS, and also we can see how the state-sponsored actors actually start adopting this kind of techniques for long-term covert operations or espionage gathering data, attack-specific targeted uh, uh, attacks on specific targets, and etc. So, but what about the golden age of the firmware and hardware plans? Yes, it's happening right now because, first of all, we don't have a good solutions for detect these threats, and also the vendors who develop, as example, UFI BIOS, doesn't provide any interfaces to basically make a forensics or develop some detection techniques. This timeline actually shows the evolution of uh, rootkits, then bootkits, and uh, showing some activities, especially on the uh, state-sponsored um, samples for uh, BIOS implants. And this figure actually have a two parts. First part, it's about researchers. It show research which has been driven by many conferences and many researchers before. And on the top, it's showing the samples based on these techniques show up after that. And we really can see the trend when the researchers go more on the research on the firmware, after that we can see something happens on the real threat landscape. And actually, number of threats is just growing every year. I just collect most of interesting media covers on this slide, but it's actually much more interesting stuff going on. If we talk about the mitigations and what we have, of course we have like a patch guard, code signing policies, and some endpoint prevention at the operating system level. And even more, we have mitigations for the boot code, like a secure boot, measured boot, and uh, boot and bias guards. But we don't have anything what is going on uh, for prevention, as I told, on the firmware and bias level and hardware even worse. But um, what, what we can see, actually, Apple recently, uh, in the last year, released uh, if I check with operating system, their operating system, because they want to collect not correct biases or damaged biases or malicious biases from the max. Very interesting because this specific tool 
actually exist on any operating system if you update for the recent version on a 6. And um, they basically uh, check the integrity in large scale and can see some supply chain problems. But of course, uh, it's not an ideal solution, but at least they try to do something. And I'm very interested actually about their statistics result, but it was never public, right? Another good example is ESET antivirus, which is actually start detecting some threats, but also what they're doing, uh, they mostly just dump the firmware images from OS, but it's no guarantee the firmware image from OS will be correctly provided and not modified by the thread to trig the antivirus solution. So, most of endpoints just detect known UEFI threads and not developed for basically detect new tricks or new attacks. And it's a lot of limitations for them actually, because they gather in information from the operating system level and everything can be fake. Think about, if you have firmware implant, an operating system requested to dump some memory region, which is bias. So you can basically modify anything on this request and then um, still persist on the firmware side, right? So everything can be fed, BIOS updates can be blocked, and even more, it can signal BIOS being updated, but it was not. Uh, no trust path between uh, endpoint solution and UEFI firmware because only operation between firmware and endpoint can help to detect something. If it's totally disconnected, how basically happens right now, it's not very useful. It is something, it's of course accidentally can detect something, but in the most cases it can be tricked. And if we're talking about the firmware implants, it's very complex piece of software, and it's very hard to debug. And I think people who have capabilities to develop, it have also some opinion how they can trick endpoint solutions. So another problem, and actually big problem, is blind spot on supply chain attacks. Supply chain, it's actually about like, you buy the server from some shop or market or like company who basically sells the servers, but on the way to your data center, you don't know what happens with your server. And as example, if you just get the server after you buy and immediately connect to your network infrastructure, that will be not really a good path to deploy a new server because you don't know what kind of firmware runs there and what kind of firmware version is there and maybe somebody just physically modifies the firmware to bypass some of the security things. And um, it's, it's actually a huge problem also for end users because you buy your laptop from Amazon whatever service and then you also don't know what is coming there. And if you doesn't check your BIOS is correct or physically modified to the recent version yourself, you can never trust to your system too because who knows who delivered your system? <laughs> it's kind of problems which is bothering me for years and I don't have a clear solution for that. I think my slides doesn't switch. And um, who watch the watchers? It's actually, okay, we have endpoint solution, but we know actually modern endpoint solutions, it's too complex. And in many cases, it's actually extend attack surface on your systems too, because it's contain a lot of complex parsers. It's contain a lot of detection algorithms 
which is sometimes even block security for detecting the threats. We also have a microarchitectural attacks, which is hardware level attacks in silicon. And um, hardware is new software because we have a lot of layers of abstraction. And for basically um, simplify development solution for the hardware, in many cases, they provide some high level logic, which is basically happens on software levels. Think about microcode, Intel microcode, it's also a piece of software, it's not really hardware, but it's very, very tied to the hardware. Firmware is everywhere, even in my watch, and who cares about security for the firmware? Actually, many vendors who sell piece of hardware, they even don't have security teams to provide you decent level of security. And became, BIOS became a kind of like foundation for the cloud security. And uh, because if you inside the firmware, you can actually get access to the physical memory and you can discover all the virtual machine instances and basically uh, invade in these memory regions. And supply chain became a mainstream, as we just discussed before. Actually, it's a PCI screamer. It's kind of like a prototype of a hardware implant. You can buy it online. Um, this small stuff, um, it's microcontroller inside USB, which is very small and thin, and even you can not, not notice when it will be connected on your laptop, right? One more thing, and actually it's more about the supply chain. Uh, Dmitry Alexiuk uh, find very cool DMA attack years ago, actually, and uh, it was a design issue where in EDK it was a problem which is allow him to have a small window when VTD it doesn't configure it yet. It's VTD is a protection from DMA developed by Intel. And a way to system management mode, but he need basically connected PCI device inside the machine. And this issue actually doesn't fix. And um, that's interesting, and um, it still exists, and, but you need a physical access. Let's talk about Windows 10 changes. Windows, change, Windows 10 actually provides a lot of good things, especially on uh, armoring the secure boot with uh, TXT and also kind of device security stuff. But what's changed? They actually have even like some of uh, HSTI drivers, which is developed by Microsoft to test on the firmware level, secure boot is correctly configured, DMA is blocked, rollback protection and other stuff. But problem are, even if it will be everything work correctly, we still have a in-memory SMM implants. Think about how frequently you reboot the servers how frequently you reboot your machine, because maybe monthly when the update's coming, right? So if you just go to the hibernate, that doesn't change the memory for your firmware. So when you open, it restores the state of the, your firmware. It's not really reboot the firmware. That means in-memory threads can live there for months sometimes. What is interesting also, maybe you not notice, but your firmware, if you buy a laptop last three years, you have a device guard Dixie. It's a SMM driver, which is have a runtime checks for security features and depend dependencies for the firmware. And actually, you can see it clearly, it's four more drivers exist on your firmware, and definitely it somehow can be extend your attack surface. The vendors like Gigabyte, 
MSI, SROC, and actually some others, they really don't care about the security. It's a small check for the BIOS log, and you can see actually any logs for the BIOS to, don't, to not to be written from the operating system level, not configured. And just to simplify understanding what is going on, for configure these logs, it's just one define, one string in the code, and they're not, they not doing it. Uh, also, for the forensics and analysis perspective, we have a lot of limitation for basically make a reverse engineering on the firmware side. First of all, uh, we don't have debugger or like any solution publicly available uh, for debugging SMM. Of course, some of uh, debuggers can leak on the market when you can buy, but Intel or AMD, they doesn't sell anything broadly. You need to sign NDA, you need to be a partner, and then you can get some solutions. And this creates a lot of barriers to basically start some reverse engineering on forensics, uh, on your system or on the system which you think can be infected. On the other side, even if you extract the firmware, it's not a lot of tools available to basically reverse engineer this firmware. You have some capabilities on QEMU, but QEMU doesn't provide you all the interfaces which is exist on your firmware, so you need to develop a lot of stuff to basically run your firmware on QEMU. Hardware level debugging, it's usually locked on the system. In some system, it's easy to basically unlock DCI. It's kind of USB 3 debugging technology, which is Intel created in recent years. But it's also basically not available on the most enterprise system. So it's Another example of the tool, it's commercial tool, T-Train, so it costs shit tons of money. <laughs> and um, hex ray is also not cheap, it provides some, um, some good static analysis for UFI drivers they developed. So, in uh, welcome to Brave New World, so we don't have reverse engineering solutions. We don't have opportunity to do runtime checks on the firmware. We don't trust the hardware which is coming to us. It's kind of interesting time. But let's talk more about how basically UFI update process can be uh, screwed up for install the implant. So we usually when um, updates for your firmware come, you have some app running the operating system level. This app communicate with the driver, and driver basically uh, map new BIOS image to specific memory region, which is triggers the event for ECMM to write something. And uh, Intel actually developed the boot guard for armor integrity of boot process, and developed the BIOS guard to armor the spy flash integrity. But you can see on these links, and actually in this year, with Alex Gazette, we presented on Black Hat about how we can bypass um, BIOS guard. And many years, I'm already talking about the different vulnerabilities in the boot guard implementations. So even if we have some solutions, it's not ideal, and it's bypassable, and nobody developed or tested properly, or it's just, so actually, it's more interesting, because hardware companies like Intel, AMD, they usually develop some reference technology, and this reference technology comes to OEM, OEM like ASUS Tech, Gigabyte, and others, and they decide how they basically implement it. And in many cases, these companies not really focus it on security, and of course they basically have a lot of mistakes on configuration of this technology, and when it's easy to bypass. And for enterprise security, 
when you basically need to update the firmware on 5,000 machines in your company, you have interesting situation. You can't go and disable boot guard manually, right? So <laughs> it's some backdoor sometimes exist on the enterprise laptops. And I will not tell the vendor this vulnerability not fixed yet, but that's funny. Um, other problem, actually, we don't have the technology for deliver firmware to your machine. Who update firmware frequently? Whoever update your firmware from after it came from the market. So you need to manually go to the website of the vendor. You need to check if update was released, then install update on your system, right? Microsoft developed actually some Microsoft company firmware update, but also you can see it. Sign and check, rely on the vendor. <laughs> so that's mean the firmware can be unsigned and came onto your computer. That's mean it can be modified even like when it's just stored on your file system. For Linux, actually, I really like um, initiative from Google and GNOME, where uh, Linux vendor firmware update uh, LVFS um, project started. So it's actually tried to develop the same thing and just deliver the updates in the generic way. But problem is, these guys need to basically contact to the vendors and vendors should basically configure and provide them uh, images for the BIOS, and then they can deploy. And not all the vendors help them to deliver updates based on LVFS. So it's also a problem. But let's think about how many steps you need to persist on your BIOS. How many vulnerabilities in the chain you need to get the persistence inside the firmware. First of all, of course, you need to get to operating system level. And this part I will not cover because um, it's out of scope for this picture. But after that, actually, you need elevated privileges for the kernel mode. From the kernel mode, you need basically to exploit uh, UFI services to attack system management mode. And if you have actually system management mode problem, and just to clarify, system management mode, it's one of the most privileges, privileged modes on your system based on x86 architectures. So basically, if you have remote code, or remote, code execution inside the SMM, in many cases, you can get read write to spy flash. Spy flash is a chip which is store your firmware on your motherboard. So basically, it's about five, six steps to get a persistence on your machine. And we're talking about the remote vectors. In 2017, I presented that way how we can get persistent for kind of like a proof of concept of ransomware for UEFI on Black Hat Asia, and you can find this video on YouTube. Why the golden age of firmware and hardware implants is happening right now? Now you actually can see it after all the previous slides, we describe the problems, right? And uh, these problems actually became even, uh, even worse just because we have clouds extending. And um, in nowadays, everything goes to the cloud. And think about virtual instance of virtual machine have their own virtual bias. That means mostly virtual server it's equal to real server in kind of a logical way, right? 
Also, in many cases, firmware was not considered a critical security asset for a long time. And now, because actually many vendors think firmware is patchable, we don't need to care about because hardware is hard to fix in the field after release, but firmware, we can fix it. And because we have a really low visibility on the firmware and hardware threats, it's not became a real problem for the vendors. Nowadays, researchers discover a lot of things, and nowadays they care more, but because they care less previous years, it still has a lot of legacy stuff, which is actually affects the security really seriously. And um, bring up, it's when, before production, before system goes to the market, vendor need to configure the system. And in many cases, people and companies who configure the systems, they not about security, they about like the functional thing, the hardware should run after you push the power button, how long it will be take to the boot the system, and they not focus on security. Because of that, in many cases, if they not check security bits, but what we discussed before, it can become a problem. I was trying to develop kind of classification for different threats which can uh, lead some rootkit installation on your system, and I group on the two, split on the two groups result of exploitation and compromised supply chain. And we can see a lot of different problems. And all these problems, it's actual vulnerabilities classes, which is can lead rootkit installation. Most interesting, of course, it's result of exploitation. And uh, I think very interesting class which is I clarify year ago, it's persistent in uh, memory. To, you execute just a shell code inside system management mode without any uh, malicious file stored on the file system like SpyFlash. It's create actually interesting question how fast the vendors patch their vulnerabilities. Average time, it's six, nine months. So basically, if you have one day vulnerability, it will be months to exploit that. And some of the vendors take even longer to patch this. Also, it is a challenge of understanding attacker tactics or creating the right mitigations because I really believe people who don't actually understand vulnerability research and did some proof of concepts themselves, they can't propose meaningful mitigations. But it's really rare type of people and not all of the companies can hire them and it's create some not meaningful mitigations, let's say this way. And offensive research, actually, it's not equal to security research. Mitigations designs, it's not equal to security architecture. What does that mean? When we're doing the offensive research, we're not only finding the problem, most cases, we show how this problem can be triggered and executed. When we do the mitigations, it's not we just say, oh, we will be, uh, put this logical component here or create this barrier and it will be block all exploits, right? And it's really a way how security architect thinks. And it's why, in many cases, after mitigations implement implemented, in bypassed really frequently, like usually not 
take a lot of time to bypass any. It's why it's important to have an internal offensive research team and uncover the reality. Also, internal offensive research team can help you to develop the mitigations inside the company. And also, it can provide kind of like a feedback to architects for basically develop meaningful mitigations. Rodrigo Branco actually create, uh, create a keynote about offensive security on the off zone. It's a conference in Moscow, uh, happens in this June. And it was very interesting when uh, he was basically discuss how the offensive research reflects on modern enterprises. I really recommend to check this talk. Let's go back to the cloud actually, and talk about the cloud problems. What can be wrong with the cloud, right? So we have the firmware security, we have hypervisor security, we have operating system security, we have virtual machine security. But if we only focus on attacking virtual machines and not go down to the stack, or if we start from the hardware, look on it. If we have the problem inside the hardware, we basically on the bottom level. And we can get attacks on the firmware and any other components on top of the stack. But even if we have this foundation secure, we still have a guest bias. And in many cases, actually, I notice uh, companies doesn't configure guest bias properly if they're using the KVM with QMO instance. QMO provides unconfigured uh, for security logs BIOS by default. And if the cloud provider doesn't have a security team or not understand the attack landscape there, it can cause them persistence in the BIOS on the virtual machine. And nobody checks the virtual machine introspection, or oh, BIOS introspection. Everybody checks virtual machine memory, operating system, applications, but not BIOS. But the BIOS have actually the same uh, privileges to attack the operating system level as in a real machine. And actually, uh, this picture shows unconfigured uh, CBIOS flash descriptor and CBIOS part of the core boot came as a default bias on QMO. And this issue actually by default there, and I actually write email to the CBIOS core boot team, and they say, oh, we not configure this just because we leave on shoulders of the vendor to create it themselves. And it's okay, but the vendors just don't do it. Many vendors, not all of them. It's another issue with just not configured correctly logs, which we discussed before, but it's also by default on the CBIOS core boot BIOS. Uh, it's five flash region in more detail. So what can be wrong? <laughs> um, actually, to be honest, um, Google have uh, shielded virtual machines just because of that. They recently developed uh, technology for Google Cloud for shielding VMs. That means they care about integrity on virtual machines instances. And also Amazon have another technology for that, but uh, Microsoft uh, don't have uh, that in Azure yet. Uh, VM guest uh, bias persistence out of of scope of any existence security solutions. Another interesting case, actually, it's about BMC, board management uh, system. So it's about like data centers mostly, but BMC have external interface, which is usually can be misconfigured and look on internet directly. And another side of BMC looking in the internal network. I would highlight a few research uh, which has been uh, presented last year, especially on zero nights about uh, BMC into revolving door. Uh, 
So the guys from Airbus basically attack BMC and from BMC attack the BIOS because BMC is connected to the BIOS to update it. Let's talk a bit more about the supply chain problem. And I really like this pre presentation from Bunny, uh, James Huang, uh, which is basically uh, present attack surface on really a uh, meaningful way he discuss how many steps you need to get the machine in your hands. And you can see it's multiple, multiple um, steps and sometimes company who develop the hardware design, they're not really responsible for the hardware production. What that mean? They develop some design of the hardware, then contact with a partner who have manufacturing, and manufacturing happens by external people. That means it's not under control of the hardware vendor, and it creates some interesting thoughts about how it can be uh, misconfigured on the manufacturing level, or nobody really know if the manufacturer add some component on your motherboard for the server, and uh, it was not a part of design. I really like uh, this phrase from Halvar Flake's keynote about nobody has a good way to assure the given device is reset into known <laughs> good state. So you can't guarantee that, especially if the hardware was under the physical attacker control. We can't check the origin of the firmware, and that's true. And as I mentioned, researchers talking about that for years, but not a lot of changes happens in reality. Why, actually, for hardware vendors, security is not on the first place? It is a many points because, first of all, security is the sale tool for the vendor. Because, actually, vendor don't really care about security, they care about the sales process. And if we go to the technical part of this question, root of trust, it's basically some piece of trust on your system, which is, as example, for secure boot, it's usually um, BIOS or some fuse inside your machine. And it's have some key or hash, which is verified first instance on the boot chain. Root of trust, bake it in pure hardware, but not really. Usually it's complicate support and um, it's complicate sales process. It's complicate a lot, a lot of other uh, steps. And it's basically vendors usually leave system unfused before it comes as example to big partner. Or vendors leave uh, some uh, components open and uh, OEM can just misconfigure that. It's a lot of open questions, and supporting the field, it's very hard, too. As example, in many cases, if you break your machine, not on, by your fault, as example, it was delivered uh, damaged BIOS update, so you go to the technical support to the hardware vendor and say, so my system doesn't boot after last update. And of course they need a tool for fix your system because they don't want to let you new system immediately, right? <clears throat> and also the big problem is secure transition between hardware and firmware. Think about, in many cases firmware developed by one company and hardware can be developed by another company. Or you have the firmware, but you need a USB-C, you need a Thunderbolt, you need a something else as an Ethernet controller or Wi-Fi. All these components not developed by uh, hardware vendor, it's developed by third-party hardware vendor. And of course, 
who basically designed the motherboard don't want to pay extra to access to source code, and in many cases, these firmwares come as a binary blobs. And it's signed binary blobs, but who really knows what's inside, right? And it's create additional supply chain problems. Interesting research by Tramo Hudson will, was presented uh, earlier this year where he basically physically analyzed spy flash read and writes to bypass a boot guard. Oh. Interesting thoughts on that. If we trust something on the beginning, it doesn't mean it will be not change it. Because the vulnerability was, uh, and the link actually on the talk of Trammell Hudson on Hack in the Box, where is the more details, boot guard check the spy flash once and have a time which is doesn't check and then check again only only on late boot, uh, boot state. So it's huge window for the physical attacker to modify it. And Trammell actually highlights this design issue on his talk. Intel ACMs, it's authenticated code models. It is a binary blobs, which is on your system too in any BIOS update. So, and it's signed by Intel, but you can't basically modify it on your side. Also, in nowadays, we can notice ACMs from Microsoft too. And these binary blobs, it's of course out of scope for security solutions, and we not understand what is inside. Some of them actually encrypted, even worse, right? Uh, we had this discussion with Alex Yermolov on Twitter and uh, about ACM Microsoft microcode downgrades and think about ACM verified by microcode. And you can't downgrade ACM if you update your microcode. But what if you downgrade both in one time? <laughs> It's create actually interesting attack vector, and it works. Alex will be presented this research on the H2 conference in the next month. Another interesting uh, wisdom from the Halvar Flex K node is current approach, approach for the firmware based on basically ensuring nobody can get in your signing key but they not care about other stuff, and it's create a huge problem. Third party components, which we just discussed, is supply chain hell, and it's like nobody cares for that time, but it will be bite us in the future. And of course, all these supply chain attack vectors, it just extend attack surface for firmware and hardware. So TPM root of trust problems, uh, we have a trusted platform model, TPM, on your machine, right? But nobody was thinking you can physically, basically intercept request from BIOS to TPM and fake it. And both Trammell and um, Jeremy Boone was showing this problem. And actually, it is POC, TPM, Genie exists on, on uh, uh, GitHub as an interposer for TPM. Major vendors trying to fix the root of trust with additional chips like uh, Google Titan or Apple T2. We also have Microsoft Cerberus and um, Amazon Greencase. But uh, these chips actually also have a firmware inside. And if you can attack this chip, you can attack all other steps. So it's make actually things much more difficult, but that doesn't mean the system unhackable now. And any hardware vendor actually doesn't have a full control on their supply chains. As I mentioned before, a lot of stuff coming as a binary blobs, even authenticated code models and microcode. Earlier this year, we also seeing Operation Shadow Hammer when 
Uh, it was attack on ASUS stack update process, and of course this update process also include firmware. So basically, if you attack the vendor website and modify the firmware image, it will be immediately reflect on all the users who download this image, right? Or if you have tool, automatically update the firmware if somebody attack your infrastructure and can deliver malicious firmware over the tool, that's brilliant, right? Way to develop, deploy something malicious. Researchers' arm race actually never stop. Researchers discover new stuff and vendors fix it not immediately. It's take a year sometimes to understand for the vendor the problem really exists and then basically develop the solution and also it's take a year to deploy on your machines. Thank you very much, Echo. If you have... If you have any questions, for the best question, I will be signing this book. It's my book, so I will be happy to sign for the best question you will be asked now. It's a good question, but I don't like it. <laughs> Alex, build of materials, it's probably, pardon me in English. Um, Build of materials is probably one of the hardest things to trace because even if you get a product in state, that product can change over a lifetime. Vendors cho choose yeah. and differentiate hardware. Now, in my job, I tear apart these hardware and I look at firmwares. But have you found a methodology? Like, I love your framework, by the way. Thank I you. love. I love that framework. By the way, I'm Stumbles the Drunk. Nice to meet yeah. you. But um, have you found a way to uh, make it more efficient to track changes in build of materials? Because that's the biggest problem is that I build know. of materials just keeps changing. And it's so hard to keep track of it. You can, you can pull firmwares off. You can make sure they're signed. You can try and do... Um, a base trend analysis in, in systems, but building materials is the thing that Thank you, it's a very good question. And actually, in my, in my research, usually I try to track the previous research and make a references to basically keep people following the full path how I basically became on the new issues. And I think knowledge base actually really suck. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I will try my best to build a uh, knowledge base, but I think it should be collaborative research, like uh, initiative for the researchers, right? Sorry, one more thing. Please publish your slides. I will. <laughs> Chicos, recuerden el eco dating después del coffee break, así que ahora ya. Vayan. Oh,